Okay, assalamu alaikum. Bismillah. Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Welcome home everybody. Well actually, welcome home to me. I just came off a flight, so <laughs> sorry about the delay. Alhamdulillah. All right, where are we? No, we did that. Yeah, we did that. Okay, we'll start here, inshallah. Okay. How's everybody? Alhamdulillah. Okay. No, did it go away? Um, I would be, uh, you know, remiss if we didn't uh, first think about and reflect on the situation right now in Gaza. Um, you know, I've I've been to Palestine uh, like four or five times now, alhamdulillah. And um, there's just a lot to say. You can probably have like an entire, you know, one hour session on just the reflections from those visits. But I think that um, beyond all the headlines and beyond all the pictures and videos that one might see, it's really, really important to realize that these are, uh, these are people with families and stories and loved ones and any any time you scroll past something or scroll to something and you read a piece of information about the devastation in somebody else's life really regardless who they are but especially if they're from the ummah that you belong to they're your brother and sister then the least that the least responsibility that we have and i'm saying this is the very least is that we should be able to stop whatever we're doing and make du'a for them and pray for them. So the scrolling and the, um, the retweeting and all that, it's helpful, of course, but du'a and donations and also working on doing islah and rectifying your own self because ultimately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept a person's du'a also based on their own state. And so if you have, if your heart breaks, which I know that it does for seeing, you know, a father carry the lifeless body of his toddler that was decimated in a building by a rocket. And if your heart breaks hearing about no water, no electricity, you know, for an indefinite amount of time being shut off by the IDF, then the very least that we could do is ask Allah Ta'ala to make it easy for them and ask Allah Ta'ala to give them strength and to uplift the oppression and ask Allah Ta'ala to allow them the ability to withstand whatever it is that's put on them. And we ask Allah Ta'ala to give them justice and to return uh, peace and tranquility back to their lives and their homes and their land. Amin Ya Rabbil Alameen. Um, there's going to be a lot of opportunities to give, and I don't want anyone here to underestimate the power of what you can give, even if it's not as much as you'd want to give, but giving something is very helpful in these scenarios. Um, you have no idea what it could mean. Okay, so we are uh, covering now this moment of realization and reflection from Prophet Ibrahim salam, And we are going to be speaking about some of the, the language in the prayer that he uses, in the dua that he makes. So we spoke about last week and we kind of began this. So I'm going to, you know, rewind and come from here, inshallah which is that in ayah number 127, uh, Prophet Ibrahim and his son Ismail, they constructed the foundations of the Kaaba. And upon doing so, they raised their hands and they asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept. And we talked about how this is a, a sign of humility, a sign of sincerity. Whenever you do something and you desperately want that thing to be accepted, you never assume, you never just you know, walk in, take it for granted that this person is going to accept it. Even if you tried your best, and even if you have all the indications in the world that this will be accepted, when you love somebody, you always make sure, is it what you want? Is it right? Is, it, is this exactly what you were talking about? And so Ibrahim, السلام, and again, this is, the series is called Becoming or Being a Friend of Allah. So how does a person transform themselves to be a friend of Allah? From this ayah, we learn that you never ever take your relationship with Allah for granted. And we never perform our good deeds 
under the you know supposition or the assumption that this is something that Allah needs and then I'm doing it and then once I do it it's good but people that are very very concerned about their relationship with Allah are those that when they do something the first thing that they do after doing a good deed is that they ask Allah to accept it from them because they're they're not paranoid but they are realistic about the possibility that maybe maybe there was something in this deed itself that was not perfect that was deficient right think about your prayers you guys what, what's the sunnah uh, uh what's the sunnah to make or the sunnah to say what did the prophet sallallahu teach us to say after we finish our prayers three times the first thing that we say Astaghfirullah. Why would you say Astaghfirullah right after you got done praying? It doesn't, it's not logical, right? If you think about it, you just perform salah. What's the purpose of saying Astaghfirullah? You didn't do anything bad. In fact, you, you were doing the right thing. <laughs> you were praying. But you say Astaghfirullah because you come to terms with the fact that, you know what? I could have probably done better. You know, I didn't have to go through the, the noodle wave menu in the second rakah. I could have done better. And, and the reality is that the, the quicker you come to this sort of realization, this truth about yourself, the easier it will be to have a relationship with Allah. Because you realize that, oh Allah, I'm offering up my deeds. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not forcing them. I'm not imposing them. I used to speak to this uncle we used to, in, in one of the communities I was the imam of, and he used to beautifully say, let's offer our salah. He didn't say, let's pray. Let's pray. Let's do our salah. He never said that. He would say, let's offer dhuhr. He would use that verb. Offer, offer. And it was like programmed that, you know what? You're not assuming anything about this maghrib or this dhuhr or whatever. You're offering it. And after offering it, just like you offer anything, you hope that it's accepted. So this humility, right? This reduction of ego is essential in becoming close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at the deed that they did. They raised the foundations of the Kaaba and they said, What? Rabbana taqabal minna. Oh Allah, accept this from us. Accept it from us. And the humility sets in. And then the aspiration of acceptance sets in. And a person starts to understand and realize that, you know what? I hope that Allah Ta'ala will accept this from me. Now, there are some signs of acceptance that you can know that you are, inshallah, doing something that Allah accepted. The first is that your sincerity is not shaken by the presence of people or their absence. So if somebody is present, you're not more willing or more likely to do a good deed versus when they're absent. And this is a tough one because it's, it's very difficult. Sometimes we're motivated by the presence of others, but we have to make sure motivation's fine, but we have to make sure that we are not doing it solely because others are present. Meaning that it's good to have good friends but even if they're not there, are you still going to be the person that you can be, the good, the good one that you, the good person that you can be in that moment? Are you still going to pray with the same urgency that you would if others were around? Are you still going to do the good deed that you would have done if people were not there to witness it? So that's number one. Number two, the scholars say, is consistency. Another sign of your good deed being accepted is that it's not like a one-hit wonder. It didn't just happen like suddenly and now it's never going to happen again. No, this is something that actually becomes a part of you. And it start, it's something that actually starts to live in within you. So you didn't just pray once in your life. I woke up for Fajr. That's it for 2023. It was a good year. Spotify wrapped, right? He woke up for Fajr once. No, you woke up for Fajr and then you started to implement that weekly. And then you started to do it daily. And maybe you stumbled now and then, but you changed your entire life, your day, to incorporate the thing that you wanted to institute. It became something that was consistent and persistent. And even if something else introduced into your life to challenge that, you would still not abandon the good deed that you had done. And the third sign of acceptance that the scholars mention is that you can see the fruit of that good deed even after you're gone. You can see the benefit of that good deed even after you're done. One of my teachers, he said, he, I asked him, how, how do you see this? How do you understand this? And he said, the job of every Muslim is to do good like the farmer plants the tree that they will never eat the fruit from. 
the person who plants that tree, the apple tree or the peach tree, they realize as I'm planting this, right, I'm never going to eat the fruit from this because it takes so long for this tree to be able to grow to a point where it regularly bears fruit. But I'm doing this, why? I'm doing this so that maybe generations later, people that come after me will be able to benefit from this tree that I've planted. So one of the signs of sincerity is that you do something and you're not even asking for the benefit. You do a good deed and you're not even like worried about it, right? Like how many of us donate, and, and, and we do this. Let me give you an example of when you've done this before. Have any of you ever donated like cash to a person or, or an organization that was asking for donations? Anybody? Raise your hand if you've ever donated a few dollars, okay? Did you go up to that person you were like, hey, can I have your tax ID so I can get a receipt for that? And, 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 and I'm not saying that you shouldn't, right? I'm not saying that you don't deserve to tell Uncle Sam, like, hey, don't, don't tax me for that because I donated it, right? Or give me my break on that. But what I'm saying is, is that the first thought that you have in mind? If you walk up to a charitable organization and you make a donation and the first thought, like forget even like, oh, this is going to give water to those in need. This is going to give, well, you know, uh, uh, medicine to those who need it, food, shelter. Forget that. You're thinking like, okay, I need this receipt so I can make sure I don't pay taxes on that. If that's the first thought, then you have to wonder if I'm doing this with the sincerity of taking care of those without even benefiting from it. And subhanAllah, you know, the hadith in Bukhari where the Prophet Sallallahu he taught us that one of the first people or three of the first people that will go to hellfire are the people that did good deeds. And when they did those good deeds, they said that they were doing it for the sake of Allah. So there was a mujahid who fought and died as a martyr and said he was doing it for God's sake. There was a, a teacher, a scholar that said that they were teaching the religion for God's sake. There was a reciter, right? A beautiful reciter. Or there was a person who gave a lot of money, a philanthropist, that said that they were doing it to support, you know, good work and charity. And every single one of them is asked a very simple question. Ma amilta fiha? The angels or Allah asked them, why did you do that? Why did you, why did you teach? Why did you learn and teach? Why did you give all your money away? And they'll say, why? So that, so that we could support, we could teach, we could benefit people. And it will be told to them in that moment, right when they say that, كذبت. You're a liar. You did this so that people might say about you, what? Oh, look how generous he is. Look how generous she was. Look at how brave he was. Look at how smart she was. Look at all the classes she taught. Look at all those tweets she wrote. Look at all those religious lectures he gave. Listen to that beautiful voice. And you know what's crazy? In the hadith it says, وَقَدْ قِيلْ It was said. You got what you wanted. You got the praise from people that you wanted. So when a person does something for the sake of Allah, it's almost like they're not even thinking about human beings. They're not even imagining them. It's like shocking. They do something and someone's like, hey, good job. They're like, oh, I didn't notice you. That's the goal that we have. That's why the hadith says beautifully what? The truest form of sadaqah, the best form of charity, is that a person gives with their right hand so sincerely that their left hand doesn't know it. Does that make sense to anybody? You guys understand? It's not about the left hand and the right hand having like this independent mind or ego. No. It's that it's one part of your body can give charity and it's so discreet. It's so sincere. It's so non-performative that the other parts of you have no idea what just happened. Okay? I don't know why these apps keep loading. <laughs> so we ask Allah Ta'ala to give us a sincerity. So imagine Ibrahim, Ismail are building this rebuilding the foundation of the house of Allah on earth in the middle of a, of a place with no vegetation. You know, now there's Zamzam that has come, but it's still not like the, the metropolis that we know it as today is Mecca. And after doing this, they say, Oh Allah, please accept this from us. Oh Allah, accept this from us. Make this something that is like moist on your tongue after every good deed that you do. If somebody praises you for something, Oh Allah, you know, may Allah accept it. May dua that Allah accepts it. Always ask that. Always ask that. And have good hopes that he will. 
Don't doubt that he will, but at the same time, don't take that for granted and say he has to. He must. Okay? So this humility is something that is very apparent in them. And then he describes Allah with two things. Anta as-sami'u al-alim. That you are the one who hears and you are the one who knows. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he heard their dua, he heard all of their hard work, he heard their conversations, but he knows what was in their heart as they did it. And Allah Ta'ala, Islam is so beautiful, Islam is so incredible, that you get rewarded for something that you wanted to do even if you couldn't do it. Like if you really wanted to do something good and you were stopped, you were unable to make it, Allah rewards you for that. It's something that Allah gives you. This is a religious tradition that we learn from the Prophet ﷺ. So Allah knows, and this is something that helps you in two ways. Number one is that as a believer, you know what? Allah knows what's in my heart. It's both consoling, like, you know what I mean? Like you do something and the person doesn't get it. They don't understand. It doesn't really, it doesn't turn out the way that you were hoping. Have you guys ever tried to bake something fancy for somebody? It ended up like a pancake. And you look at the picture and you look at what you made and you're like, this is not what I was... We got to go to Kroger. <laughs> we got to get a cake. You know what I mean? Like you tried. You tried. Right? And I'm using this example because it's, it's very real. If you guys tried to do the right thing and been unable to get there, yes. Allah is so generous that he rewards you as if you've done it. But it's also intimidating. It's consoling, but it's intimidating. Consoling in that what? You tried and Allah knows you tried. But Allah also knows when you didn't try. al alim He's intimately aware when you just didn't care. And he knows when you just phoned it in, right? You just gave up. He knows. And so Allah's measure of your success for accepting you is your effort. It's not about what you accomplish. There will be many people on the Day of Judgment that will be entering Jannah who did not accomplish anything. They didn't accomplish much. Let me tell you a hadith that might strike you. The Prophet ﷺ said that for the person who recites Qur'an smoothly, fluidly, beautifully, they get one reward. They get rewarded. But for the person who stops and stutters and makes mistakes and goes back and goes forward, they get double the reward. How does that make sense? Does that mean that we shouldn't aspire to read Qur'an beautifully and fluidly? No, no, no. What it means is what? The person who had every reason to give up. I can't do this. It's too difficult. I'm not good at this. I'll never get good. Let me just listen to somebody else instead of me reading. Every reason to give up kept going. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, you know what? For you, the person who persevered, who did everything, even though they had every reason to stop, you get double the reward of the person who had no difficulty at all. Omar one time was asked, who gets more reward? The person who has no desires to do bad things so they never sin? Or the one who has desires and fights themselves? And then they stumble, but they get up and they fix themselves. He said, the one who has desires and fights themselves and they have to work hard at it. Because he said, you have any idea how difficult it is to keep sincere in a moment of weakness? It's so difficult. So Allah's acceptance is not predicated upon the the body of work that you produce or the, or the portfolio that you have. It's all here. Your portfolio is in your chest. And no one knows it except for Allah. I'll tell you a story just to wrap this up. I went to school at a university in Chicago. Uh, and I remember that there was, you know, uh, when you're in college, you're just kind of dumb. I don't know how else to explain it. You just think you know everything, and you're like, I got this all figured out. You're not even paying your own car insurance. You're like, I got this all figured out, right? So, <laughs> so I mean, some of you are still on your parents' phone plan. But anyways, okay. So, <laughs> um, it's like 300 minutes. Nights and weekends are free, you know? So there was a, there was a group of people. There was a group of brothers and, and, and this is a sensitive topic, but I'm going to address it because I feel like we have to have honest conversations. There was a group of brothers that saw that there was a sister in the MSA who did not wear the hijab. And, um, 
every day when she got to school, she would like put on the hijab. So she would arrive without the hijab and then she would put it on. So instead of being like prophetic and empathetic and having empathy and like trying to like, you know, support, just being kind. You know, they, they chose to make it something that was like a, a joke, a mockery. Oh, you think that's hijab? Ha ha ha. Right. And uh, just to let you know, I was not part of this uh, group. So then we found out what had happened. We found out that this sister, for four years, her parents, basically, if she put on the hijab, they would beat her. And so she had to leave her hijabs in her trunk of her car. And she had to go to the parking lot of the school and put it on because she wanted to wear it. And they would, you know, make jokes about like, oh, like, does it match? And why is your hijab this? And your clothes? Because she didn't have her closet in her car. She just had whatever hijab she had. Allah rewards people like that <laughs> beyond like, I don't know if the group of people that found it funny to make fun of her, I don't know if they will have the good deeds that will amount to just one of those moments of sincerity that morning putting on the, the, the hijab in the parking lot. And this is the beauty of our religion, is that if we were to judge each other, I think everyone would go to hell. If we were in charge on the Day of Judgment, I think everyone would go to hell. But because Allah's in charge, we all have a chance. Because he's in charge and because he's so merciful and he knows exactly how sincere each and every one of us is and how hard life is for us and how difficult we, 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 it is and how much we try, we actually have a chance that Allah might take our trash and turn it into treasure on the Day of Judgment. We ask Allah Ta'ala to make that the case. So we ask Allah Ta'ala to accept from us. Never ever run away from that phrase. And then Ibrahim a.s. he makes this dua. رَبَّنَا وَجَعَلْنَا مُسْلِمَيْنِ لَكَ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِنَا أُمَّةً مُسْلِمَةً لَكَ He's praying and he says, Oh Allah, allow us to be people who submit to you. Allow us to submit. And we talked about this before. Submission has like a couple different stages. There's the initial stage where you are brought to Allah by some circumstance in your life. Maybe it was your parents. Maybe it was your friends. Maybe it was your family. Maybe it was some tragedy, some difficulty. And somehow, some way, you are brought to Allah. And then you have a moment of independence, let's say, or like you have a choice. Do I want to stay here or do I not want to stay here? And in that moment, you make the decision. And when the person decides that they do want to stay close to Allah, then they reach a state of submission, which is willing submission. So Prophet Ibrahim is teaching us now what willing submission looks like. You know, willing submission is when a person chooses to make the right decision, not because they have to convince themselves, but because they know that it's ultimately better for them. He's asking Allah, make us those who submit to you, who are those who believe in you. And not only him, but who else is he praying for? His progeny, his children, and his grandchildren, and all those who follow. And this is a really important point, that the friends of Allah, those people who are close to Allah, they realize that the decisions they make right now affect not only themselves, not only their children, but their lineage to come. Their entire generational progeny will be affected by the decisions that they make now. Whether or not, ready for this? Whether or not your children see you praying. I mean, look, there is no video more adorable on the internet than a child praying. The wrong direction, with their aura showing, in a soiled diaper. It is the cutest. But where do you think that kid learned that? Do you think the kid was told, do this, do that? No. Have you guys ever seen the video of the kid that tries to read Quran and it sounds like they're making Arabic in a blender? You guys ever seen these videos? This is called, in education, it's called modeling. And these children are simply repeating what they see. They witness something and they see it. That's why Habib Omar, Habibullah, he said very beautifully, I want you to listen to this. Okay, and I know many of us in this room, maybe our parents, many of us are not. But 
the decisions you make now affect what kind of parent you will be. It's very hard to change who you are suddenly. It's very difficult to change who you are suddenly. You have to work on changing who you are now in order for you to be who you want to become so that when you do have little eyes staring at you, you have the ability to make the right decisions. Habib Omar said, your children's eyes will teach them more than your lips ever will. Your children's eyes will teach them more than your lips ever will. I was playing FIFA with some friends a few years ago, and one of the guys got scored on, and he dropped the loudest F-bomb. <laughs> he got so mad, right? It's like it's his day job. And his son was right there, hiding behind the couch, watching. So his son was like four years old, five years old. And he's like, man, he said the F word. Fun. <laughs> and his son goes, just repeats it. Yeah, Baba. And just drops it right there. And you got like, all of us are like, do we call Child Protective Services? Like, what do we do? We've never witnessed such a horrific thing in our life. And you know what, you know what the dad said? What, 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 would any, what would any parent do in that? You're embarrassed. Like, you, oh, God. He like slaps himself. He's like, what was I thinking? And he goes, hey, no, no, no. He goes, look, you can't say that. And what did the kid say? Why? The kid has no idea what this word means, by the way. He goes, why not, Baba? And then Baba, the Baba responds. He goes, by the way, this is not me. I'm not pulling one of those, my friend. This is not me, okay? I don't take video games that seriously. Everyone's looking at me like, yeah, Baba, what did you say? No, no, it's not me. I'm talking about somebody else. So he goes, why? And he goes, because Baba got upset. Baba shouldn't have said that. It's my fault. It's my mistake. And he goes, no, Baba, listen to this. This child transformed into like a sheikh. <laughs> listen, to, I'm so lie. I was here. I, was, I witnessed this. He said, no, dad. No, Baba, you said it, and whatever you say, I can say too. And he wasn't trying to be rude or mean. He's like four. But he was saying, no, Dad, you're my teacher. You're the one that teaches me. And whatever you say, I'm going to say it because you're my dad. You're my hero. You're my Baba. He didn't know it was bad. He was like, oh, I'm going to do this, right? Now, think about it. This, I don't want this to become too meta, but think about the things that you witnessed as a child that you learned from your parents, from your dad, from your mom, from your maybe grandparents, uncle, uncles, aunties, right? Think about the behaviors that you've modeled as a result of simply just witnessing, not being told, not being instructed verbally, just being told or just, just watching it. And realize how, it, how absolutely powerful that imprint is on you. So Ibrahim a.s., he's standing there with his son and with, together, they're asking Allah, Oh Allah, رَبَّنَا وَجَعَلْنَا مُسْلِمَيْنِ لَكَ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِنَا أُمَّةً مُسْلِمَةً لَكَ Oh Allah, make us Muslims and by, deep, by, 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 by that reality, make our children also a nation of Muslims that will submit to you. Like, Oh Allah, make us Muslim enough to carry this forward. Like, I know I'm not going to be perfect. I know I'm not going to be flawless. But allow me to carry Islam well enough to where it doesn't run out with me. And that the people that I'm raising or that I'm around can look at me and take whatever I do, whatever little I can do, whatever you've accepted from me, and they can take it and they can keep it moving forward. And what are those things that are so important? Wa'arina. And show us the rituals. Show us the rituals. And turn towards us with forgiveness. You know, a lot of times we don't understand and value how important the ritual is. We think that the ritual is something that gets in the way of our life. Right? But there's a reason why the word ritual is found in the word spiritual. You cannot be spiritual if you don't master the ritual, right? You just spiral. You just leave. People want spirituality without ritual. It doesn't work like that, right? 
What makes a person? What gives a person? When does a person feel the highest in their iman in a given year? I'll give you two suggestions at, toward the end of Ramadan and toward the end of Hajj. And if you've never made Hajj, trust me on that one. Ramadan and Hajj are the two, uh, well, Hajj is a, not a month, but are the two moments, right? Ramadan is a month, Dhul Hijjah is a month, but Hajj is from the first 10 days, are the two moments in the life of a Muslim where they feel the most connected to Allah. I would, I would you know, we're just going to accept that. I'm just going to put that out there and I'm not gonna, we're not going to debate it. Why? Why is that there? Because that is the peak and the culmination of ritual. Ramadan is nothing but ritual. Get up, eat, drink, start your fast, pray, go throughout your day, break your fast, go to the masjid, pray as much as you can, go home, get some rest, rinse, repeat. Read some Quran, give charity, rinse, repeat. Your entire month. You know, Ramadan, like, people stop. I want to see Netflix's, like, usage statistics. Netflix has, like, a Muslim dip. You know, people try to go watch movies in Ramadan. And, like, it's, it's not haram. But people are like, really? Let, you know what? Let's, let's try it out. Try to go watch a movie on the 27th night. See what your friends look at you like. Like, hey, it's the 27th night. Let's go watch a movie. They'll be like... What? Because it is the culmination of ritual. There is a level of spirituality that cannot be replicated. We can always watch a movie in a week. We can always watch it next month. We can't do this now. Hajj is the same thing. And so he says what? Wa manasikana. Show us the rituals. Guide us to be able to practice. Specifically, of course, this is speaking about the Hajj, but by extension it's speaking about what? It's about your entire Islamic life. Do not abandon Allah by abandoning your responsibilities with Allah. What has he prescribed? What has he prescribed for you? Anyone that wants to accomplish anything has to follow the plan. If you want to get better with antibiotics, you have to finish the course. If you want to do well, right? What do people do when they sign up for pre-med and med school? There are people that sell courses. Follow this. My plan will get you through. People want to work out and get healthy. Follow this. My plan will get you through. We have no problem admitting that plans help us get through. Religiosity, ritual, worship is the plan of spiritual growth in Islam. I can't not pray and then say, why don't I feel close to Allah? It doesn't work like that. I'm not following the plan. Right? Watub alayna. And then turn towards us in forgiveness. Because I know that I'm going to be short. I'm going to fall short. So forgive me when I fall short. Innaka anta tawab rahim. You are the one who turns toward us with your mercy. Rabbana. Now this is amazing. Rabbana. Wabi'athfihim. Oh Allah. From that progeny that he just prayed for. Wabi'athfihim rasulan. Allow from them to come a messenger. Allow from them to come a messenger. Minhum yatlu alayhim ayatika wa yu'allimuhum al-kitaba wal-hikmata wa yuzakkihim innaka anta al-azizul hakim. Oh Allah, allow... You guys got to pay attention for this one. Okay? Because this one, there's something that happens. I got to just... It's amazing. The Quran is so amazing. Oh Allah, send from them a messenger that will do four things. Are you ready? Okay? Everyone hold up your fingers like this. Four. All right. The first is what? Recite to them your revelations. That's number one. Number two, this is what he says. Teach them the book. Number three, and the wisdom. Number four, and purify them. Okay, you guys see those four things? All right, you can put your fingers down. Later in the Quran, listen to this. This is Ibrahim's dua. Ibrahim is making dua for who will eventually become who? What's his name? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that what? I am the answer to the dua of Ibrahim. This is his dua. He said, I am the answer to that dua. He made dua for a messenger to come from this people, from here, from Mecca. And I am the eventual answer to that dua. But listen to this. What's the four-step process? Number one is recite the revelation. And then it's what? He says... 
teach them the book, the Quran, the scripture, and the wisdom, how to apply it. And then it's purify. So it's recite, teach, purify. Do you get that step process? That's what Ibrahim is proposing to Allah, based on his best guess. When Allah responds, Allah says, Verily we have sent a messenger from amongst you, يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِنَا وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابُ الْحِكْمَةِ Allah says, He recites the verses and purifies them and teaches them the book and the sunnah. Which one's flipped? The purification, right? The purification, Ibrahim, السلام, he proposed for it to be at the end. Once they get acquainted with the revelation, once they learn it, then they'll be pure. Allah responded by saying, that's not how this works. It's a good guess, but it's not how this works. How does a person achieve a pure heart? A person achieves a pure heart by familiarizing themselves, engaging with the recitation of the book of Allah, and that purifies their heart and prepares their heart for knowledge. See, Ibrahim thought that maybe it's knowledge that purifies. And although knowledge helps, the reality is that purification is the preparation for knowledge. I'll give you an analogy just to carry this. Ali radiallahu anhu, he said something very powerful. He said that knowledge, knowledge goes to the house of action. Knowledge approaches the door of action and knowledge knocks on the door. He said, if action answers, then the knowledge will come in and stay. Just like a good guest, a good host, right? But he says, if action does not answer, then the knowledge leaves. What's the best way to learn something? By what? Doing it. What's the best way to learn something? By doing it. You learn by doing quicker than any other theoretical way. You could read it a hundred times. You could read an instruction. Have you guys ever built a shelf from Ikea? Try reading how to build a shelf from Ikea. See if you figure that out. But when you do something, it enable, it gives you the experience and the wisdom and the understanding. So Allah responds by teaching all of us a very important sequence lesson. If you want to be able to know enough about your deen and to hold on to that knowledge about your religion, you have to work on purifying your heart. The knowledge of Allah is like pure, clean, cold water, and your heart is the vessel that holds it, the glass. If the glass is dirty, the water becomes undrinkable. If the glass has filth in it, the water becomes undrinkable. Before you fill that glass with that cool, crisp water, you have to clean the glass. You have to scrub it. And some of those stains... Have you guys ever tried to clean like cereal after it's dried? That stuff is stronger than cement. Some of that stuff you have to soak and scrub and you have to wash over and over and over until it gets out. That's your heart. That's your heart. The Prophet ﷺ, he said in a hadith, Al-halalu bayin wal haramu bayin. The halal is clear and the haram is clear. And he says, and between them, وَبَيْنَهُمَا that there are things that are gray area that many people don't know about. And he advises in that hadith for people to stay away from things that they don't know about. Follow the halal and stay away from the haram. At the end of that hadith, which sounds like it's all about right and wrong, he says what? Inna fil jasadi Verily in your body there's an organ. Ida salahat salahal jasadu kullu. If it's good, the whole body will be just fine. Ida fasadat if it's corrupt, the whole body has no chance. It's corrupt. It's the heart. The things we watch, the things we say, the things we listen to, all of that deeply impacts this here. And then we want to learn more about Allah, but we haven't done the requisite work of cleaning this piece right here. And so stuff doesn't stick. So we have to cleanse the heart. How do we cleanse the heart? Number one, tawbah. Scholars say, tawbah. Have a regular regiment of repenting to Allah. Go own up to it. Just own up to it. 
You know, I, I don't know if you guys have ever gotten into a fight with somebody before. Not a fist fight. Like an emotional fight. Have you guys ever done that? Okay. I don't want to hear about it, but just have you? Okay. So you have. And have you guys gone have you guys gotten into a fight and then like, you know, if you live with that person, like you just went to bed? Or like if you don't live with that person, you just like went your own way and then you met up again later? Yes or no? Okay. In that moment, I want you to imagine this. You got into a fight, and that was the last communication you had. And then you meet up again. How do you, how do you say hello? <laughs> you start laughing. <laughs> how do you say hello? Who's sweating right now thinking about it? They're like, oh, God. Conflict avoidant. How do you say hello? There's only one right answer. You don't. It's hard, isn't it? Why is it hard to say hello? Like you fought the night before, you yelled at each other, the next morning you wake up, are you just like, hey, what's going on? What kind of coffee you want? Is, is that how it goes? What do you need first? What do you need first? You need closure. Yeah, apology, you're right. You need to make the apology. You gotta get closure. If somebody hurt me and offended me and, and oppressed me and did wrong to me, and then they just left and went to sleep. And the next day we met up and they're like, hey, so are we, are we, what are we doing today? Well, <laughs> hold on. I don't even know if I want to see you. We still have some stuff we got to figure out before we d do anything. You gotta, we got to first come to terms with what just happened last night. This is a metaphor that can explain our relationship with Allah. It's true. Allah is always available. And we don't say waiting like he's waiting, but he's always available for anyone who wants to get close to him. But the scholars teach us this. They say that the first, the key, ready? The key for the door that takes you to Allah on that path is what? Repentance. Because you're carrying a lot of baggage. Like I haven't prayed in this many years and I'm just going to show up like I'm Allah's best friend. I first got to be like, oh Allah, I'm sorry. I know, that I, I know that I struggle. I know that I don't do this. I know that I don't do that. I'm weak. I'm weak, Allah. You are so forgiving. I am so weak. But I'm coming to you, O Allah, because you told me to come to you. So before I move forward on this path, O Allah, I want to tell you that I know that I'm weak. And I want to own that so I can get closer to you. That's tawbah. That's repentance. Number one, how do you clean the heart? What's the first step? Tawbah. You got to repent. We got to own up to it. Don't run away from that ownership. Number two, you have to replace the bad with the good. You have to replace the bad with the good. You got to cut out the stuff that you do that you know is not right. You know, you got to, you got to take, you got to, you got to clean up your playlist a little bit, right? You got to delete some of those songs. I'm not even going to dignify them with a, a reference here. We got to get rid of some of this stuff, man. It's not good. And even passive listening. Oh, I'm not really listening. I'm listening for the beat. Right? You, you might be listening for the beat, but shaitan is trying to stick that stuff in your heart. And this stuff, subhanAllah, Imam Ghazali said that the eyes and the ears are the quickest access to the heart of the human being. Even when you're scrolling, you have to be careful. You have to be careful to guard your eyes from things that you know potentially could be problematic. Take very, very good care. Be very cautious with your eyes and your ears. And then the next step, the scholars say, is to surround yourself with pious company. Make sure that you spend time with people that encourage you to do the things that you know are good for you. Right? Make sure that you spend time with those good people. So Allah Ta'ala is teaching us this. That purification of the heart will give us access to knowledge that will make us those who are close to him. And then he continues, Religion has been talked about or proposed as being like a foolish thing. Allah Ta'ala says, no, actually, the only individual that turns away from religion is the one who is foolish, the one who forgets their purpose who doesn't know why they're there, who doesn't know how to 
do what they were created for and walk down that path. Then he says, وَلَقَدْ اسْتَفَيْنَاهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا And then he says, وَإِنَّهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ لَمِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ He says, Ibrahim was one of those few people that was chosen in this world. How can you turn your back on him? How could you leave him? How could you ignore him? How could you turn your back on the path that he carved? And if you want to be from amongst those that are righteous in the afterlife, you got to follow Ibrahim alayhi salam. We'll go ahead and conclude here, inshallah, because Isha Idan has just come off, and I know Isha is going to be about five minutes, and I don't want to give a lecture about the importance of prayer, and then we keep going through salah. So inshallah, we're going to wrap up here. We ask Allah Ta'ala to accept from us, inshallah, and to allow us to be those that truly have sincerity, that we never ever assume that our deeds are accepted, but we yearn and seek for Allah's acceptance in all of our deeds. We ask Allah Ta'ala to allow us to purify the heart, to scrub all of the soot and the dirt away from the heart so that when we listen and gain knowledge of him, it's able to come into a clean vessel. And we ask Allah Ta'ala to allow us to practice all of the lessons of this beautiful book. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Um, so like I said, Isha is in about five minutes, inshallah. So for those of you who are uh, here, obviously you can join inshallah in the musallah. For those of you who have sat on chairs, if we can have some of the volunteers grab some of the dollies to bring them in and we'll stack up those chairs, if you can help out with that. For those of you who are sitting on the back jacks up here, if you could do me a huge favor and just line them up nicely in the front of the room. Hasib, if you could help with that, inshallah, just kind of guide. Just line up the back jacks, inshallah, these, these floor chairs so that we can clean up, inshallah. Jazakum khairan wa salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.